Hey, what's up, Lee Ron here. Today we'll learn how to paint trees a la prima and how to generally paint a la prima. A bit of a messy approach, but a very fun one. I'll also be taking basically the style you see for this tree and how gray and muted it is and kind of extrapolate it over the entire reference to make it my own and more interesting. So let's get to it. So there's quite a lot to talk about in this process. I will start from the drawing stage though. Uh, and this is one of the maybe major mistakes I made though. It's not that terrible, but the tree on the right, I got it to kind of fat on the lower end and really thin on the bottom end, but that's fine. Should have used more of the sides of the page as a guideline. Uh, but the drawing is actually quite simple here. All I care about is getting the trees in, their shadows, and anything else that can tell the story of perspective. So the moment I have one or two trees in, I can start putting that diagonal line representing the edge of the road on the right side uh, and where the foliage begins. And that's going to tell us a lot because depending on how uh, horizontal this line is, the lower our angle is. Now, the more vertical it is, it appears, it will appear as though our angle is higher. Okay. Uh, and that's the main functionality here. Now there is the other side of that road. Uh, and then we're going to start putting in those trees. Um, and that's pretty much all you need to really establish the scene itself and the look of it. Now I will focus a lot on the trees here. So it's going to be good for anyone who's kind of struggling with that. Um, one of the things to pay attention to is the trees have two main components to them. Obviously there's the trunk and the and all the branches and the splits in the trunk. And then we have uh, the foliage itself, the leaves and all of that. Now the leaves and the foliage is where most people have trouble. By the way, sorry for the ambulance. Hopefully that's not coming through too badly. Uh, the foliage and the leaves is where most people have trouble with because there's this tendency to try and draw the details and that really doesn't work in watercolor. What works better is drawing the overall shape if you connect the details. So if you were to connect all of these individual leaves, what kind of a shape will you get? So now I'm at the stage of putting in those uh, branches and, and trunks. And it's not that hard, but if you don't have any drawing experience, really take your time with this stage. Um, for example, I should have gotten this tree a little more to the right and up. I was kind of in a hurry because I was really stoked to paint the scene. I was fairly excited about it. Um, but yeah, so that kind of messed up some of the of the perspective and composition because these trees should appear to be farther down in the distance. But depth isn't really the key thing here. So that's still fine. Like the main story is still there. Uh, but for these trunks and branches, really take your time and find what's called plumb lines, uh, compare vertical and horizontal lines and ask yourself, does this branch intersect with this tree that's behind it uh, vertically or horizontally? Really ask yourself tr and try and find relations and connections. You don't have to draw pretty. You don't have to be skilled with the pencil. The only thing that matters is that you get things in the general vicinity of where they should be, right? Uh, for example, this cast shadow, you can change quite a lot there and it will still look like a cast shadow, right? And there are all of these shadows splattered across the floor and that's going to lead to some beautiful patterns, uh, a lot of interest there. Uh, this, this, the entire story here is the trees against the background, really, uh, and how the light and shadow patterns are created around them. That's the only thing that matters here. Um, so it's very forgiving in terms of depth, even. Um, and in using different values or using temperature, which you will see, um, I'm going to use a very neutral color scheme, a little more on the cool side, actually, um, but very straightforward. Now I'm erasing some of the lines that are behind the trees just to give myself some clarity. It's not a must and you won't even see them in later stages, honestly. Uh, but I wanted to get rid of them for my own clarity. Now this patch of foliage background as well as the tree is key because that's a part of the big composition. And look at how I get those leaves in there. Just, just a squiggly line. I'm not drawing each and every leaf. These are things that even if you want to, <coughs> excuse me, draw each and every leaf. And here I am making the top a little thicker because it was way too thin. It's still a little off balance, but that's fine. Um, 
if you want to paint every leaf, you're you're welcome to do so, but do it in a way that connects them. So paint a leaf and another leaf that touches it and another leaf that touches it. And that's something we can do later in the painting stage. So you don't need to indicate it now. In fact, I'd much rather you have clarity of shapes right now and really see everything properly. It's much more important in my opinion. Now a big part of this process, as I mentioned, is going to be a la prima. So I'm going to try and connect a lot of shapes, merge things together, and hopefully they will still make sense. As for the colors, as I wrote down, ultramarine blue and manganese blue hue are kind of my two blues. Uh, I use the ultramarine to blend a little more, uh, to mute, sorry, and neutralize a little more, while the manganese blue hue is more for getting that stronger blue that has a presence to it. Uh, the Indian yellow and quinacridone rose, it's a nice little color scheme to get pretty much anything you want uh, because it's in the cyan magenta um, yellow structure. Um, and of course, I have modified it. I love Indian yellow over lemon yellow. Um, and I have ultramarine blue and also manganese blue hue, but that's fine. Now, this wash is fairly easy, so I don't want you to overthink it. My goal here is to tint the paper. Uh, it really is about that. Actually, what I wanted to do is paint the sky and the road in a way that is flowy, because you'll see there is a gradual transition of value on the road itself, and also the sky needs to be left very light. And I didn't want to leave them paper white, uh, so I'm tinting the paper essentially with the temperatures and kind of colors I want. The only thing that is going to stay the same pretty much is the lightest part of the road and the bottom between the two front trees and the sky. Okay, so instead of painting around the sky and then adding the sky, or instead of painting just the sky, I did one wash that covers everything up. And we talked about this before, you know, whether you want to cover the whole paper up or just work in patches. In this instance, it was a much better, much more suited process to go over everything and tint it. You're not losing too much. You'll still have the ability to blend in the next washes uh, because it's such a thin coat. It really doesn't matter. You see a lot of it is just water with a bitty, bitty bit of uh, paint and not much more than that. Now we will use some wet and wet here to bring out the lower left section of that road and the top right part. Uh, and that will create a lighter gap in the middle. And you will see it, and it's beautiful. And the tree in the front has some hints of purple at the bottom and blue, so I'm also touching it with that. Um, but this is really kind of fun. You won't see a lot of it later on. So you can use this opportunity even just to practice some wet and wet. Uh, but the key here is to get that middle of the road <laughs> in a, a bit lighter. Now look at how wet my wash is. I just thought I'd turn the paper around a bit and show you. It's still wet. I finished the wash and it's still wet. That's how I worked in it, kind of a tea consistency. Now I'm switching over to... Uh, these brushes are cold. Uh, I wrote it down because I forgot. To, uh, I had a brain freeze. Uh, black tulip brushes, of course, that uh, Fabrienne Morales sent me. Uh, she's a black tulip brushes ambassador. Uh, I will link everything down below. Uh, she sent me these a while back and I told her that I will definitely review these. So I'm using them to get myself more familiar with them. Uh, so a couple of interesting things about the brushes, just real quick. Um, Again, it's not. I'm not getting paid for it, but I did get the brushes as a as a gift to review. Um, I really like the the control they allow. This is the flat one, and I did want a flat one for this stage um, to kind of go into it. You know, uh, I love the shape. I love the sharpness. Uh, one thing that I'm still testing out is the water capacity because in another brush, it's kind of a cat's tongue tongue the the uh, the water capacity wasn't wasn't as great as I'd want to but it is a given because it's thinner um, but in this brush generally what I don't like about flat brushes is their water capacity is eh, not so good but for this one it's actually really good so I've been enjoying using it uh, so far a lot so black tulip brushes I will link down everything below uh, but I will do a proper review in the future so this is just kind of me playing around with them so as I mentioned a la prima and this is really important I'm starting and I'm already building up everything together. So what do I mean by that? The top is very dark, right? Where the, f the, s the top of the foliage is, all the leaves. Uh, the it's just the dark green. And then it connects itself to tree trunks that are lighter. And I'm letting everything touch together. Uh, so at this stage, what I'm thinking is, how can I get away with doing this in one ongoing continuous wash? without losing the flow and still getting the values to where I want them to be 
all the while avoiding the highlights. And that's the real challenge here. So you see the right sides of the tree trunks have some serious highlights on them, which in my opinion is what makes this scene so beautiful. And I forgot to mention, I already painted it. I will show you now or maybe later. Uh, I'm gonna write down the time. It's around uh, nine minutes and 40 seconds because I wanna remember to crop it in. Um, old painting because I did paint this and I, I remembered it much better and now I'm like, whoa, I improved since. Uh, but one of the elements that I really was focused on when I painted it before was that highlight on the right side of the trees. So that's something really important. Uh, it is what makes the tree trunks be distinct and even be visible and makes them pop. And, and what does that tell you about the background? It tells you one important thing. The background has to be dark enough to have them pop against it, the highlights. Because right now, the background is as light as the highlights, right? And notice how the highlights aren't paper white. I did not skip them with the first swatch because I still wanted them to have some kind of a color. Now, while the top is wet, I'm trying to make the most of it and come back and re-wet it, and, and not re-wet it, but do wet and wet with a very dark value. Um, because the top is still much darker than, than I got it, and it's going to dry lighter. So I'm trying to do that kind of a thing. And look at how my process is all over the place. Painted the bottom of the trunk, uh, the base of it, with a very strong paint. And now I'm connecting that trunk that's a little lighter to that bottom, right? So th the Alla Prima process is very messy. What you have to do is trust the process, focus on the fundamentals, which is <clears throat> as accurate of a drawing as you can, as accurate values as you can, and maybe as accurate colors as you wish. But but as long as you focus on these, place the things in the right spot, uh, you can pretty much travel across the painting. And I know it's sometimes unpopular advice, and there is merit to painting a large washes that connect the shapes even more. But if you can pull it off, the result is really beautiful because you then get both a wash that is flowy and even and connected and merged, but also you get a sense of a truth that exists with the scene that is you're not able to very often capture as well if you're painting in thin glazes right? And all of it is subjective. All of it is a matter of taste. So you find what works best for you. For me, I definitely find that to get that fresh look, I need to get things done in one go. And the result is this, this messy wash. But with that messy wash, look at how beautifully shapes are connected. Look at how some of the darker spots melted into the existing shapes, right? And don't worry, we're going to improve this greatly. We're going to patch a lot of things up. This is a quite a, it was quite a challenging process, but also very fun. And it's one of these processes I enjoy jumping head first. So uh, really looking for those values. You see there, there are these rocks there. So I'm trying to paint them while I can still touch that existing cast shadow just to get a better flow. Uh, and by the way, I am utilizing a lot of my water sprayer in this process anytime something doesn't merge enough doesn't blend enough you give it a, a bit of a spray and it will wet things and get things moving okay now I want you to wait also to the end of the process to truly judge the painting and I want you to apply this advice to your own paintings as well but what you'll see is when I show you the scan you'll see all the subtleties the high quality scan does show it and you'll see how beautiful this looks um, now I wanted to darken the bottom of the road once again and the purpose of that is to send all the light to that area that is not darkened. So how do you convey light? By conveying shadows. So how do you get an area light? You darken around it. And the area I want light is that in between those two trees, uh, that's where the sun kind of burns the ground the strongest. So I really wanted to get that in. And now we can move on to the tree that's closest to us. Now we haven't finished with the background, uh, the trees on the left at all, we will go over them once again uh, in some sections, okay? Uh, I tried getting some something initial that is that is as best as I can. Uh, and by the way, you see things a little lighter too because the, the light's at a bit of a weird angle, to be honest with you. It, it looked much darker from my uh, perspective. So yeah, things are a little weird, but that's fine. Uh, now here's the thing. So I put this color in and everything is still wet. So look at what I do here. I recharge colors into it, I can continue working it more and more and more. Uh, and I know there is some merit to and I do believe in, you know, applying the wash in one go is usually the best to get the colors showing and be pretty. Uh, but there is a trade off to that in which you 
can't do anything to it. So if you want to change stuff around and you force yourself not to, that can also end up being uh, at a detriment. So what I'm doing here is indeed reworking areas, adding colors, adding values. So yes, the wash may end up not being as fresh as it could, but I do want to put in the right colors and the right values in there. So I am allowing myself to do that. Okay, it's all trade-offs. There isn't one correct answer. There isn't one correct way of painting. There aren't really any rules when you think about it. In a very, you know, it's, it's fun to say, oh, there aren't any rules to art. But in a, on a very practical sense, there aren't. If you look at 20 artists, you'll find 20 different painting methods. So everyone has their own rule, their own the things that work for them. And, and I think you do the best if you find out what works for you and your own rules, right? Um, and make sure you don't go too wild with the self-imposed rules. I do think there's time for that. Uh, I think sometimes it can even help get you out of a rut and things like that. It can really help because when you force yourself to, let's say, okay, I'm going to just paint a painting with yellow and red. If you feel a lack of creativity, you're like, well, I never did this kind of a thing. So what'll what'll happen now? And then you're forced to try something different. And that can kick you out of uh, a plateau or out of just feeling uninspired uh, very often. Uh, so yeah, now remember what I said, don't judge the painting until it's over because we still haven't got the background in and that's the major component. So let me get on to that. Uh, now you'll notice in terms of value, yes, this front tree is darker than the background, but funny enough, the difference isn't huge. It is pretty significant, don't get me wrong, but it's not like a black and white kind of a thing there. Um, so you want to make sure that you get just the right contrast between the two. Uh, green has a very interesting quality to it that it can be very dark in the shadow but if light passes through it and behind it look at all these leaves in the background they're really bright because the light goes through them because they're kind of transparent if I'm not mistaken that's a big part of it and that's really beautiful uh, did some wet and wet on that tree trunk in the front uh, and now I'm putting in some darks at the bottom and I want to help it climb uh, upward so I'm flipping rotating the paper uh, and helping it, I'll, you'll see, I'll put a bit of this very dark color that is a combination of uh, ultramarine blue and my uh, Kuminakadon rose and Indian yellow. Uh, so I'm darkening, 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 and then I'm going to come back with uh, my water sprayer, spray on it and kind of help it move down a bit. Um, and again, this is a very useful trick. So here we go, a bit of a spray, uh, and it helps it move. Uh, so there are a lot of these, oops, sorry, bumped the mic. Hopefully that wasn't too loud. Uh, there are a lot of tricks you can do that, that really help in that way. Um, and you only learn with time, really. So we're around maybe 55% finished with the process. Now, I'm making the most out of it. If it's still wet there, I'm going to start doing doing more wet and wets and more of everything. Uh, I'm still focused on that tree trunk at this point. But now it's time to continue with the background a bit. Now, you'll notice the background starts light up top, but then it goes dark. Uh, so I will try and imitate that kind of a look. Uh, it also has a bit of a dark spot there up, up top. Maybe it's some leaves and branches dangling off the tree behind. I'm not sure, uh, actually. But here we go. Started with light, and then you'll see me starting to push it dark below. But one thing you want to pay attention to, again, shapes and values. So you got the value kind of in the ballpark, but then look at the shape. You have to make sure to leave enough room for that highlight on the tree trunk. Right, that's where our highlights come from. And by the way, I see a lot of people obsess over your their shapes. So like, did I get the shape to look just like it is in the reference photo? And the reality is you're far better off not being too perfectionist, perfectionistic with the shapes um, and being more oriented towards the flow and the watercoloriness of the painting. And here I am darkening at the bottom. The flow to me supersedes the accuracy of the shapes because a beautiful fresh painting that was painted uh, with strong conviction is much better than a timid one where everything is more accurate to me, my opinion, right? Some people may prefer the uh, 20 glazes, hyper-realistic paintings. That's just not the style I'm after personally, not in my work and also not really in the style I enjoy looking at the most. I can definitely appreciate the skill, but I don't enjoy it as much. So I'm definitely more in the camp of get a fresh wash, really get a fresh wash and, and use more water than you think you need to. Uh, because then the beauty of it, if it's wet, you can go darker, you can darken it. You can go lighter by lifting. You get so much more time, so much more freedom. There really isn't any downside to painting wet, 
right properly. The only downside is if you need a spot to be really dark, putting a very wet wash there means you'll have to compete with the existing wetness on paper. So that's probably the only instance where um, I will avoid uh, going very wet and, and maybe even just put the dark there and then touch it with a wet wash, you know. Uh, reverse the order. Remember, there aren't any rules. You don't have to go light to dark. Um, so it seems like I'm losing some of the plot here, but don't worry. We're going to have a comeback uh, once I put everything in the right place. Now, I do have to apologize. At some point, I think I hit the... I like to sometimes stop the recording and uh, turn it on again so that I know how to edit. Uh, at some point, I stopped it and turned it on, but I did it too quickly, so it didn't go on. So you'll have to forgive me. I'll tell you when, and you, it will be obvious because it'll skip a few stages. So sorry about that. That was actually um, really annoying because it was a point in the painting process that I really enjoyed, and I think I did a really good job. But oh well, you can't win all the time. Um, as for these brushes, again, I really enjoy them. So far, it's really nice. Uh, I hope it continues that way. I have like three more to test. Um, and yeah, yeah, there's there, there are so many good brands out there. It's really amazing. Um, for brushes and paints and you know paint I think uh, is one of those things where I'm the most non-brand focused it's like I'm gonna I'm using five brands simultaneously with brushes yes I did learn to find a thing that works best for me which will be Lebensen, Skoda um, and we'll see how these go I did really like silver black velvet at the time um, and yeah with paper it's Saunders, Waterford or Arsh these are the main two I don't like Fabriano as much you know uh, but for paints, <laughs> I use everything. It's so funny. Uh, so yeah, getting some of these details on the trunks. Uh, my vision's a little clouded at this stage, so um, this is why I'm kind of I'm searching. See, I'm I'm going over everything, and I'm like, okay, where should I darken? Where should I push it the contrast a little more? How should I do it? Um, you really have to be patient with these things. Um, and I, and I do look at this as kind of my attempt at learning the scene. Uh, in fact, just watching this process really inspires me to do a bigger version that is twice the size, and in which I'll be a little more um, deliberate with the stages, so I'll know exactly what I'm doing. Uh, so kind of a hybrid a la prima and not a la prima. Uh, and also one more thing to have in mind is the drawing. The drawing really does influence it. The one advantage when you're not painting tiny is that you get more room for the drawing. And so you can get more details in and get more of an accuracy and kind of... A tip I like to give people is draw larger if you're having a hard time. And that's for drawing and sketching exclusively. It just works better sometimes. You know, if you're drawing tiny, it's hard to get a lot of details in. It's hard to really pronounce the shape. So I hope to do a bigger version. Uh, but you see, the main thing I'm doing now is darkening. Darkening everything I should. Uh, there's this another section of the foreground, uh, background foliage that's really important there. Um, there's this tree branch I had to straighten up a bit, but it's really hit by sunlight, so uh, I wanted to leave it as light as it is. Uh, you will see a bit of a shadow on its left side, so here we go, putting it in. Um, flat brushes, I, I always oscillate between liking and disliking them, but I think where I'm at right now, uh, I'm enjoying them. I'm enjoying flat brushes. Uh, they do have a lot of versatility to them. You can go very thin with the thin edge, you can go with the corner, you can fill in large spaces. I know a lot of people die by their, their flat brushes, so yeah. Uh, now this didn't feel dark enough. Remember, I told you, you need to get just the right contrast. So I'm glazing over it with a mix of French Ultramarine uh, and a bit of my Manganese Blue Hue. Uh, maybe a bit of Cronacodone Rose, just to darken it a touch, okay? And you'll see once it dries, it doesn't go too dark. It really is on point. I also tried widening the top to make it look less awkward with the very wide bottom. Uh, but there's quite a lot of work that we'll do here in terms of highlights and adding things with opaque paint. So it's, it's a really fun process that allows you to add and subtract. Um, and I really enjoy subtracting, actually, um, in a way, like adding white. You know, imagining the negative spaces and adding white. Uh, I find it very different from just using masking fluid. Uh, or masking tape even, in a way. I don't know, it's more graceful to me. Uh, so pushing darks a bit up top, um, just to make sure that it contrasts well enough with the uh, tree barks or the, the trunk or whatever. <laughs> I don't know, there are too many words, and the branches and everything up below, uh, up above. But you see, I'm, I'm really searching, and there's this very dark spot there that I'm trying to get to create a stronger contrast with that tree. 
um, really, really searching. You could paint this a completely different way by working in sections and focusing on a shape, getting the most out of it, and then moving on to the next shape. But I kind of sacrificed that for the connectivity aspect of it. So I'd much rather connect a lot of shapes um, and maybe get some lines kind of not in the right spot because it has more grace sometimes. Uh, so yeah, again, I think the point we get back to constantly is there are no rules. Really paint your way and try and paint the same scene multiple ways. Uh, because you'll discover that maybe you prefer different processes to the, with different uh, methods. Uh, now I want to focus some more on the light of the light on the foreground. So let me darken that background. So you see the road uh, on the left where there is sand there. It's not really the road, uh, but also some of the road. I'm just going over it with a very pale wash uh, of a similar mix. And notice how that helps to centralize the light even more in the foreground. Um, <clears throat> again, the way to lighten something up is to darken the things around it. Um, and that's the same for everything, including this road, including cars and their taillights. It, it always works, right? It's all um, it's all in relations. And also color, as we've seen in the latest video where I showed you that bright red tree <clears throat> in the color matching video. Um, the bright red looked bright red because it was contrasting with some other beautiful muted colors. So, yeah. Um, so now it's time to really get in and bring out the most out of the shapes of the of the foliage against the branches up top. Uh, really just fixing and adding some of these dark spots where I see them. Uh, a lot of it is me squinting. Squinting a lot and trying to see the abstract patterns. Um, because that's what they are. And if you can really let go of what is there. Um, at some point I will probably focus more on what is there and try to paint things as they are. Uh, but I find that for my impressionistic style, it works really well to focus on what things appear to, what they look like, not necessarily what's there, which is completely the reverse of when you're trying to understand what you're drawing better and you're trying to really uh, draw three-dimensional objects from imagination. That That's completely different. So patching up this kind of a shadowy part there, the bottom should be a little uh, darker, but also a little thinner. That's something I, if I recall, I will fix later on. Uh, but throwing in these kind of half dry brush marks um, for the tree behind it really helps to bring out some texture. Uh, here I am inventing some branches. You will see me adding soon more branches, even in, in a white gel pen. Um, so that's really fun. Uh, I find that to be a fun part of the process. There are some beautiful shadows that cast onto the road there uh, on the right, uh, right, rightmost side and also here. Um, but really building up the shapes uh, very slowly. Now it's time for some highlights. So I'm using my John Brilliant, my Shinhan PWC, kind of opaque watercolor. It is a watercolor. Uh, a lot of people think it may be gouache. It's not, it's watercolor, but it's just a little uh, opaque. And I'm trying to mix it with what I have on the palette, but it's just, not, there isn't enough flow. So you see me kind of struggling with it. I don't want to add in water necessarily because that may dilute it too much. So I'm going back to the tube and trying to get some paint out of there to mix with what I have on the palette uh, before I apply it to paper just because I wanted it not to be as bright straight out of the tube. Uh, the way to do that is either to add a minuscule amount of water because you still want it to be opaque or some other water paint mix on the palette. This is the same color I use sometimes to turn colors more milky and more like the, it can even brighten some colors. It's very interesting. This white is very interesting, similar to titanium white, if I'm not mistaken, in visuals. But you know, if I really examine this white, it looks even a little peachy or orangey. So it, it's definitely not as cool as the rest of the painting. If you want cool, you'll have to use a maybe neutral white um, or even white that has a bit of blue in it, right? Uh, the gel pen I'll, uh, I'll be using later uh, will show you that. So I switched to a smaller Lebanon brush just to get these tiny little highlights over there in the far background because my brush was a little too large and awkward. But you see how slowly it starts to come together. Now in a moment it's going to jump and you'll see the background is going to be dark. I just don't recall exactly when, but it's sometime after this stage. Um, so yeah, don't be too mad at me because I missed it. Uh, some highlights on the tops of the tree trunks, they are visible like dots, rays of light. Uh, I think ideally if I paint a larger version of it, I'll be able to get these to look better. Uh, and look at what I'm doing here. I'm spreading a bit of that white over inside the foliage 
to create the sense of gaps through which light comes. And here it is, the jump, sorry about that. Darkened the background and added a lot of this white jump. And that's the main thing I did. I did add a bit of darkness on the shadows on the road, but mostly I just darkened the background and added these, you know, random branches and, and weird shapes uh, using the white gel pen. Um, the reason I decided to use it, it's just better accuracy, so for the really small details, I found it easier. Now I'm using what's called a pale green, also by Shinhan PWC. Uh, it really is a green, and it's great for green traffic lights and strong green lights. Um, and because it's foliage, I thought I'd use that to assist me in getting in some of these gaps in the trees and, and maybe some random highlights and details on them, just to give the viewers something else to look at. Uh, it isn't necessarily important, but I think it looks really, really good. And now a few small touches of very dark color. I just didn't like the shape of the top of that tree trunk. Now I'm signing it prematurely. You'll see me adding some more details after the, fa the fact. There is a, a bit more uh, to improve here. Um, mainly there is, okay, so some shapes of the highlights that I want to break off because it's not just one complete highlight that breaks off in some spots uh, and leads to a more organic look. And also there's a shadow on the road uh, behind that I want to um, add in there because it adds a nice contrast with the third tree from us. There's one, two that splits into two and three. Uh, the one I'm working on, the one behind it, uh, you will see. Uh, but just adding a few small touches, again, breaking off these uh, highlights that I left there, it's not as important. Uh, and it, it actually is important to break them off so they don't feel too artificial, like a perfect, perfect highlight. So let's remove the tape. Also prematurely, I will go back and then add that shadow that I mentioned earlier. Uh, feel free to cor correct, you know, if, if you're not happy with something, correct it again and again and again until you're happy, even after you remove the tape, it's not too late. Uh, so here I am doing that and as I mentioned, I do urge you to stay for a few more minutes and look at the scan because the scan really brings out some of the nuances and the colors. You'll get to see the manganese blue hue much better. Uh, it looks really good in my opinion. Coming back with some water to spread it out a bit, I don't want it to be as dark, so you see, like this. Um, and connecting it to some other shapes to make it look organic. Um, and kind of straighten out those edges, but then we're done. I'm gonna show you in just a second the final result. Uh, just to continue this shadow on the left. Um, just a few small touches and here it is. And let's zoom in a bit just to show you the full details. I hope you enjoy this one. Let's wrap it up. So thank you so, so much for watching. Once again, I really hope you enjoyed this one. We went really farther from the reference photo, went for a little bit of a grayer, moody kind of a scene. Now, I hope you enjoyed seeing the process. And again, a la prima is something that is a bit tricky to teach. All I can do is explain the rationale and the planning behind what I do, but then the execution is very dependent on uh, what I see at the moment, the mood, uh, how much I feel like playing around and doing some nonsense just for the fun of it. Um, but I think just by practicing rendering the value you see as accurately as you can and placing it in the right place, which is the essence of this approach, which is why we also removed most of the colors, you will be able to do it on your own. And my suggestion would be to practice that specific skill of seeing something, putting it the right value, the right place, have a good solid drawing as a foundation. But in any case, I hope you enjoyed this one. Don't forget to check out my frustration-free watercolor course if you wanna learn how to paint like this. Link will be in the description box below and I do think I'll also put this one for sale on my gallery. So I will put a link to that as well, lirongallery.com. Thank you so, so much. Leave a comment, leave a like, let me know your thoughts and subscribe if you still aren't. And I will see you again in the next vid real soon.